I know, Bob, you also mentioned that you still have your cravings. How do you deal with it? Well, the first thing is to be aware that you're having a craving and to understand that it's going to pass. But I felt it's very important for me to talk about this in therapy sometimes with uh, a counselor that's not going to judge me or broadcast it. These are sensitive topics, and you have to have someone you can talk to. I've also talked to people in Parkinson's support groups that have had similar journeys you know, with this kind of medication. And uh, it's very helpful to talk this over with you know, a peer-to-peer. -peer. And uh, I'm just very grateful that I've had the resources available to me to get through this. So important. Thanks. Thank you. And we talked a little bit about is, it, is one more common than the other one of these uh, well, disorders? I guess the most important thing to comment on as far as the um, quantitative sense of it is I think the numbers are, are much higher than what you cited. And it's very difficult to get a sense of how many people have it because, first of all, it is a continuum. It's a spectrum. So where does the behavior go from being, I always like to shop, and now I'm shopping a little more, to I bought a drone, to I bought 10 drones, because those things happen. So there's clearly a point where it's abnormal. And there's clearly a point where it's the baseline. But for a lot of people, it's in this gray zone in between. But in my experience, I really think it's closer to a third of patients who get this and who take the dopamine agonist in specific. And I think that's very important to know because most medications, when you look at the list of side effects, there are things that happen in 5% or 1% or 1 in a million. What's the prognosis for people who are diagnosed with impulse control disorders? Well, it's a tough issue. Um, I'm not going to make things more romantic than it is. Uh, it's treatable, uh, but it means a long trajectory. You have to withdraw the medication. There's actually no other drug that you can use to suppress the side effects of the dopamine agonist. So you have to get rid of the drug either by lowering the dose or get rid of it entirely. If you do that too rapidly, patients will experience withdrawal syndromes. In fact, this is exactly what Melissa was referring to. We even have a name for it. To, dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome. So tapering the drug very carefully can lead to uh, a reduction in the symptoms, hopefully get rid of it entirely, using the stuff that Bob was talking about, a counselor and uh, being aware of the problem also really helps. And if you do it well, then the prognosis is good. If you leave it untouched, if the family leaves it untouched, then it can be really devastating. Have you found success with this in your practice? It's very important to taper these drugs slowly, but sometimes even with an incredibly slow taper, people get the dopamine agonist withdrawal syndrome, or DOS, um, and so it's not always as easy to get off of it um, as you would hope. It's very important whenever um, someone is attempting to reduce the dose or come off of a dopamine agonist that they're very closely monitored because the symptoms aren't obvious. When people have alcohol withdrawal or withdrawal from other drugs, there are visible changes. But with this, it's all internal symptoms. Um, and you're not going to see the anxiety. You're not going to see the depression or the lightheadedness or the nausea, um, panic attacks, those sorts of things. If you catch this nip it in the bud, then it's much easier to stop the medication.